Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start with a short story. Um, I have a friend who's an IT admin for a large corporation, uh, and he recently started getting all kinds of alerts on a user in the network who's constantly sending large attachments, usually um, encrypted zip files, in and out of the organization. So he dug a bit deeper, and he found that the same user is actually uh, constantly connecting to unknown Wi-Fi networks and instead of the corporate network. He dug deep, deeper, and he found that the same user is running all kinds of unknown applications and running as local administrators somehow. So they ran into his office, hoping to find a guy in a hoodie that's hacking away the system. But in fact, they found that this was one of their best employees. <laughs> Doesn't look like a best employee, but he was. So they asked him, why did you do all that? And he said, well, you know, I just couldn't get my work done. I tried to get customer files into my machine, and the USB is blocked, so I had to send it over email. And I tried to get to websites I need for my work, but the proxy didn't work or blocked it or was too slow, so I connected to the guest Wi-Fi network. And I tried to run a WebEx plugin update, but I don't have a local administrator account, so I can't do that. So unfortunately, this is not just one story. This is uh, the daily reality of employees worldwide, and I'm sure you've all seen it before. Uh, we as organizations are forcing our users to choose between security and productivity. We either restrict them completely, and they can't get their work done, and then they'll find work around, or we let them do whatever they want and sacrifice security. So today I want to discuss uh, why our current security approaches are ineffective, degrading the user experience, and maybe we can build a better architecture. So let's take a step back and talk about the attacker's perspective with the common uh, strategies that we see out there for the endpoints. So if you look at VDI, uh, taking your desktop and putting it in the data center on some virtual machine remotely, then if I'm the attacker, I'm just going to either exploit the virtual desktop, remote one, or the physical endpoint for me, which you control that VDI desktop. So I have plenty of options. And from the user's perspective, he gets a, lay, a bad experience with a remote connection, laggy connection, and inability to work offline. So it doesn't really work. And if you try uh, all kinds of browser-based sandboxes, like uh, protecting just the browser from incoming uh, web attacks, then if I'm the attacker, I'm just going to pick any other attack vector out of the hundreds that are out there on Windows. So it's not really stopping the bad guys. And from the user's perspective, um, you get all kinds of compatibility issues with web browser plugins and all kinds of broken websites. So you might uh, improve the authentication with uh, two-factor authentication or other methods. And if I'm the attacker, I just want to wait until the point of time where you authenticate it successfully, and then I'm just going to write your session and do whatever I need to do. And you might even go for the um, antiviruses, next generation antivirus of the world. You know, by the end of the day, the attacker can just build a legitimate application, that, uh, something that would look like a legitimate application, and just pass any kind of heuristic engine. And the attacker can also attack the underlying operating system, which is like a Swiss cheese full of monthly vulnerabilities that we find. And finally, you can go and um, have network segmentation, which is a healthy thing to do. Uh, but me as an attacker, I'm just going to look for the right users that have access to multiple um, segments, and then I break the segmentation. So in light of these drawbacks, we see the industry taking a huge shift towards environment isolation. We see it here in Singapore, where the government is taking a bold step of air gapping the employees, uh, the public servants. Um, we see it with the SWIFT organization, which is actually recommending its customer, um, the banks, to separate SWIFT endpoints from the rest of the world. And we see it with Microsoft, the big Microsoft, that's actually saying, you can't trust Windows for your privileged access. You have to have two different laptops if you're some kind of sensitive user accessing sensitive data. That's quite a bold statement. And while it truly is increasing security to go and do a full air gap uh, solution, it doesn't, uh, isn't practical for most enterprises out there due to cost or productivity cost. So if you're considering some next generation architecture for your endpoints, here are three key principles we think are worth considering uh, as you do that. Number one, um, you got to design for failure. You can't expect us humans not to make a mistake. We will make that mistake. Uh, you can't trust an OS that was built 30 years ago and has 40 million lines of code not to fail. It will fail. 
And you can't trust a solution that's made of 100 different moving parts as it will if, uh, fail eventually. So whatever solution you're picking, you've got to architect it for this kind of failures that will happen. Number two, you've got to free the users. Um, if the users can't get their work done, if they're fighting the security team, it's going to be a lose-lose situation, and they won't uh, make it. Um, don't block them from getting their work done. Don't uh, make them work over a remote connection. You've got to give them a local experience and the ability to work anywhere. And number three, you can't just abandon everything and build everything from scratch. You've got to be compatible with your past and your future, your applications, your operating systems, um, any IT infrastructure you have around the endpoints, any hardware that you have for the endpoints today. So is there an architecture that can follow these guidelines and be both secure and pro provide productivity for our users? Um, well, we want, um, let's think about it together, we want to have a highly restricted environment on one hand in which you access the most sensitive resources in the organization in an ultra lockdown manner, and you also want to have an ultra permissive environment where the users can be connected to the world and productive. But we also want it on a single piece of hardware, on one laptop. That's what we want to have for our users. But luckily, um, laptops and desktops of the past five years or so has in increased in capacity and virtualization technology has matured dramatically so that today we can actually have multiple virtual machines running locally side by side on a single laptop. So we can have a local hypervisor running those environments in virtual machines which are isolated from one another and also in a seamless way to the users so that the users don't notice the fact or don't need to know that they have multiple environments under the hood. So this kind of architecture, uh, virtual air gap architecture, if you'd like, uh, we believe is a win-win situation that can provide both security and productivity at the same time. If we go back to our story, that poor employee could have gotten full web access, um, ability to plug in third-party files into one environment, uh, plug disk on keys, install applications, and on the other hand, seamlessly, when he's working on the most sensitive resources, if he's an IT admin managing IT systems, if he's an HR person watching salaries, if he's uh, paying and doing payments over Swift, he can do it at the same time in another ultra strictly locked down environment. So we know this architecture is not just in theory, but actually feasible today. Uh, we're actually building it with Hysolate and testing it with customers for the last year or so. And um, we believe that today we are able to embrace this environment isolation trend in a way which is both uh, providing security and productivity. Thank you. Thank you.